Thank you, Dr. Holt. Uh, really the foundational piece in understanding your labs, really, again, integrating you into that shared decision-making model is critical. I'm going to pick off where John left off and, and talk about AIH more from a 20,000-foot view and uh, kind of answering the questions how and why. And in parentheses, I put a playbook. Now, this is just a meager junior hepatologist playbook to AIH, but uh, these are the things at least I felt I have learned uh, working with a number of patients with this disease. Let's just slide forward, Gabe. Great, thank you. Again, the aims are to review the uh, current understanding of autoimmune hepatitis pathogenesis, at least from what we know. Establish the basis of AIH uh, disease heterogeneity, meaning why are some patients so different than others? This will also be uh, talked later on with Dr. Tana's talk in some regards. We'll also identify treatment goals and things that we should be focused on as clinicians, as patients as well. Further, we'll uh, review my own kind of top clinical considerations of disease management and potential strategy as well. We'll start off kind of light, and uh, I like quotes, and I think that this is one uh, by Dr. Osler. Dr. Osler was a clinician at the end of the uh, 1800s, early 1900s. He was a found, one of the founding fathers of John Hopkins and had a lot, of, a lot of key quotes. He says, the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. And I put this here for one reason, is, is really patients have refocused my approach to AIH, particularly through social media, surprisingly. Uh, Dr. Oser was a champion of a lot of things and really talking to patients, the subjective content of what patients have to offer. Now, another quote, I'll see if you can figure out who said this, when you treat a disease, you win, you lose. You treat a person, I guarantee you win, no matter what. That is someone less famous than Dr. Oser, it's Patch Adams. I think, <laughs> great movie, um, but still I think there is some merit here. And again, approaching the patient as the patient, not the disease, is probably the underlying key piece here. Sir Luke Feltz painted this picture. It's called The Doctor in uh, the late 1800s. It was actually an interesting time in medicine. We were getting science and new technology, and we were moving away from the subjective component of medical care. We were focusing on the objective. We had these tools. We had medications. This was painted in the setting of what we thought was the change in looking at the patient. The patient was really an accident of the disease. I'm going to use that to frame my tenets of practice in AIH, and really the focus is to treat the patients and not the numbers. And if I ever mislead you throughout this conference, I want you to know, if you think you know everything, then you absolutely know nothing about this disease. And I think that is the right approach to take as a clinician, but also, you know what, as a patient as well. And I don't know everything at all. And, uh, but again, I think the longer that we work with patients, the more we understand we don't know. AIH, as you all know, is generally unresolving inflammation in the liver. This is specifically uh, driven by T cells. But the interesting thing about AIH is it affects all ages, all genders, all ethnicities. We know this lymphocyte attack of liver cells that Dr. Cummings will talk more about in person. It causes cell death and destruction this destruction can then activate cells to lead to fibrosis. And scar tissue, as we'll talk in a bit, is one of the key pieces of therapy endpoints. This can be hard to diagnose. It's associated with a number of symptoms. And many of these, as you all know, can be very debilitating. Treatment is typically with lifelong immunosuppression, and hopefully not uh, of, of steroid sparing agents, hopefully. But some will require chronic steroid therapy as well. A very important piece, as I've already spoke about, AIH patients, much like snowflakes, are not the same. And unfortunately, the medical community for many years have treated AIH patients as the same. We know everyone is different. We know a young patient presenting with AIH is much different than the male presenting at 60 years. We still need to basically embrace this and try to integrate this into some care model, uh, at least with more finer strokes versus broad strokes. We know AIH is a result of broken tolerance, and ultimately it's tolerance to yourself. And we think the relation of this is probably founded in environmental exposures, but you must have some genetic predisposition. It is this interaction, which is probably very, un very complex, that shifts the balance of the immune system, 
more to an infector or active uh, type of reaction where that is then driving inflammation in the liver to form at least what we know as autoimmune hepatitis. We think actually maybe there may be some component of the immune system that also may play a part. These are called regulatory T cells, and they actually may be a little deficient, but also they may not function correctly. Ultimately, what causes AIH? What is our current model? And this is complex, but if you follow us online, we talk often, environment and genetics. And speaking, speaking of genetics, there has been one large genetic-wide association study that has identified really one genome-wide signal, and this was for something called HLA, which we'll talk about momentarily. We see a very large proportion of other genes that are at least associated, but not necessarily statistically significant. So not only immune genes, so genes that actually regulate the immune system, but genes that are probably outside of those areas as well. The other thing, this term you may see up here called epigenetics, this is actually how the body actually opens and closes and modifies DNA. Uh, we have very little understanding of epigenetics and its role in maybe modifying DNA and putting people at risk. Secondly, uh, we, we see drugs and viral causes. Um, we know medications, the, the poster children for this, minocycline and macrobid. There's a slew of others, things like ibuprofen, anti-TNFs, even the statins have been linked to this. Viral, as much as we hate to kind of bring over the idea of viral hepatitis A, B, or C, these have all been linked with autoimmune hepatitis, also including things like mono, Epstein-Barr virus, and CMV as well. We think the gender age may play some role in this, and again, how that relates to the underlying susceptibility, we're not certain. Other environmental pieces we've talked slightly about, but how about microbiome? We've talked a little bit about this in past conferences. The gut microbiome is made of bacteria. These cells may modulate inflammation or, or even uh, hepatic uh, risk for inflammation uh, because of the makeup of this here. Coffee, cigarettes, and also diet have been linked with other things, particularly in some of our sister diseases, PBC and PSC. We still are trying to understand how these potentially could play a role. Finally, stress. Um, I put this up here because there has actually been documented cases, but also series of patients developing autoimmune disorders in general, having a major life event. And actually, it's a majority of patients. So maybe if you sit and think, you know, when I was diagnosed, what happened in those prior six months before that? I don't have an understanding of mechanism. It's an interesting thought, though. There's another current thought that maybe stress could be some a management of stress could help to induce remission or even be a part of treatment protocol in the future as well. This is kind of my current understanding, what I think of when I think of what causes AIH besides that last slide. We know here on the left side is total disease risk going up to 100%. We're not even anywhere close to that. We're probably down more in the 5% range. But as we progress across the right of the slide, we hope to understand these pieces. These pieces are exactly what I just highlighted with you. Known genetic risk, but also the unknown genetic risk interaction between genes and how those actually relate, heritable epigenetic modifications, genetic environment interactions, and then unknown environment, which we are all exposed to as soon as we are conceived in mom's womb, and then known environment risks as we start to understand these, how we can develop a model of AIH. As you can see, there's a lot of variables and hard to study. HLA is also known as human leukocyte antigen. This is a protein that actually, what's called an antigen-presenting cell, puts on its surface. Once it takes a piece or an antigen from outside the cell and presents it to the immune system, as in, look at this, is this something abnormal? Is this an, a potential bacteria or virus or something that's going to hurt me? And in fact, there is an area here, if I can use my pointer, right here in this binding pocket, there have been genetic mutations or alleles or variants, if you want to call it, that have been linked the most strongly with AIH. And in fact, these alleles, as you can see, HLA, DRB1, that is a gene. O3 and O4 are basically the variants. If you have these variants, which probably 50% of the room has, we see an increased risk of autoimmune hepatitis seven times, but there's actually been studies that said up to 14 times. The idea is I kind of highlighted uh, the antigen which presents outside of the cell is brought in it is loaded onto one of these molecules and presented to the immune system to allow the immune system to decide, should we be excited and should we activate based on this? The question is, what is this antigen? And we don't know. Um, and, and actually, in many autoimmune diseases, we don't know. The goal of AIH therapy comes down to really one thing, if you ask me, and it's really fibrosis. Starting on the left is really what the liver tissue should look like. 
This is a core biopsy. As we progress across the screen, we actually start to see fibrosis deposition, um, and I'll let Dr. Cummings talk more about it as the pathologist, but you can see on the far right, we see obvious cirrhosis with thick bands of collagen staining on the trichome stain. However, I will pose one question to this audience. Are we thinking about this wrong? Should we actually be thinking the other direction? And for years, I think we've all thought stability is key in terms of fibrosis. But we also know in about 30 to 50%, depending on the study, we should be targeting regression, potentially. Some clinical considerations. In my kind of overall global approach, does this patient have AIH? And this comes up often. Um, we'll talk more about that. Is this patient high risk? Is this patient primed for bad outcomes, not only in the next year, but 20 years from now? Does that change my therapy now to predict the future? Treatment optimized. Is there anything I can do as a clinician to guarantee this patient has fibrosis stability or regression? And then concurrent issues. And am I doing a good job as a provider in making sure that this is well controlled and the patient's quality of life is as good as it can be? So why are doctors so dangerous? Well, Yes, we are passionate about what we do. We are led with evidence-based data, hopefully. However, data changes. And this is kind of jokingly, but I found this book, How to Survive Your Doctor's Care. <laughs> I cause side effects. But again, this is where you in integrate it into that model to understand the risk for this potential uh, really comes into play. So I'll ask you again all to kind of consider that is your doctor is trying to help you, but these therapies we provide can be very toxic. This is uh, word soup, and again, no one ever likes to look at this, but uh, this came out of the uh, late 1990s from the International Autoimmune Hepatitis Group. We don't necessarily need to go over it, but it basically was designed for trials and or research. And how do we identify patients with AIH? And honestly, I can't remember the last time I actually computed the score because I typically don't have any of these pieces. Um, but ultimately, the sensitivity and specificity, sensitivity is basically the amount of positives that are, or the percentage of, or proportion of positives that are truly positive. So a high sensitivity or true positive rate or a high uh, true negative rate is actually a good for a test. However, this is clunky and really not well tolerated for clinicians in the clinic. We look more for something called the simplified AIH score, a little bit more uh, easy to complete, developed in 2008 as a response to this clunky tool. However, because it is more streamlined and things that we get often, we also see that the true positive rate and true negative rate um, are a little bit different, specifically on the true positive rate. So 70% are the proportion of patients actually have this disease that are testing positive, which leaves 30% of patients that may come up negative. The good thing is also negativity-wise, if you are not, if you don't have this result, you likely don't have autoimmune hepatitis. Now, clinical and laboratory considerations, as I am considering the idea of this patient has AIH, we think this is primarily hepatocellular injury. Going back to what Dr. Holden said, AST and ALT, elevations are all over the board. They can be very just abnormal to intermittently normal, up to 50 times upper limit normal in the acute presentation. We typically think of that level alkaline phosphatase, which again is more affiliated with the bile duct, Typically normal, but we do see elevation and sometimes in, in poorly controlled disease. But it also may make you think, could this patient have a variant syndrome or something overlapping on top of AIH? We think elevated globulin fraction or IgGs are, are probably important. We see these in about 85% of patients. And then also the autoantibody profile should kind of speak to us. But again, I will be honest with you, um, this is not the only thing that is paramount. So it is a constellation of labs but also the clinical picture and onset that is really important in establishing the diagnosis of AIH. Thinking about that presentation, has the patient been exposed to any hepatotoxic drugs or drugs that have been affiliated with autoimmune hepatitis? This also includes things over the counter, so complementary and alternative strategies as far as herbal supplements, uh, Chinese medicine, these are the things that I ask patients and grill them commonly. Anecdotally, I will be honest with you and we'll see what you guys think. Um, I see a very high proportion of use in patients with autoimmune disease. And honestly, it frightens me just a little bit. We wonder if there's anything that has presented with this patient that could be viral in nature. Again, looking back to the viral hepatitis, uh, A, B, and C, but also mono or influenza. 
um, CMV, these other things that give you kind of an idea that there could have been a triggering event that started the inflammation. Is there concurrent autoimmune diseases? We see about 50% of patients with AIH have some other autoimmune disease. This could be a big flag. Most common being thyroid, uh, Sjogren's, uh, some of the most leading. Daily alcohol intake, uh, I question everybody about this. We think alcohol can obviously ab cause abnormal liver tests, but again, this would be a threshold to make me think of maybe not such an important player in AIH diagnosis. We talked a little bit of viral hepatitis, but what about fatty liver disease? And at the end of the day today, Dr. Gilmore will talk a little bit about this phenomenon of fatty liver combined with AIH, and maybe this is a different phenotype, but the, the fatty liver patients can present with the same elevation liver test, the same pattern, but also the antibodies that we see in AIH in about 15 to 25% of patients, depending on what study you look at. Finally, does the liver biopsy support this? Um, again, we'll, we'll, we'll throw that to Dr. Cummings. Um, treatment of steroids, if someone has come to my office and they've been given steroids and they have responded, that definitely is helpful. However, if they're struggling, I have to think, is the diagnosis right? Is there anything that I need to be doing, actually, if it is correct, that we need to alter therapy? I look at patients to, to basically risk stratify as well. Um, we'll start with the, the, the arrow in the intermediate category. What are things that would make me worried about the high-risk patients? And so some of those things, just to kind of highlight some of them, and what we have seen in historical studies is cirrhosis is probably bad at diagnosis. And we see an increased risk, um, and not to be a downer, but we see all colors mortality to, to, to basically be sooner. Uh, transplant for survival is what we typically talk about. Um, these patients tend to go to transplant or death before someone that doesn't have cirrhosis. Other high-risk groups are patients that we cannot get their ALT under control. And this has specifically at least been studied at 12 months. Soluble liver anti antibody, as uh, Dr. Holden said, we think at least some data supports the idea that this phenotype with this positive SLA may be at risk of worse outcomes. Uh, unfortunately, men that have this disease, we also look at you a little different. Um, they may be harder to treat and have worse outcomes as well. Childhood onset, um, less than 18 years. We've seen this as a big risk factor to go to transplant as well. They tend to just be harder to treat, require steroids more, and also multiple agents. We also see the variant syndromes. This is more anecdotal, to be honest with you. Um, coming from IU and our experience, they seem to be harder to treat as well. Uh, finally, a few others, again, which are somewhat anecdotal, but there is a little data behind it. Vo low vitamin D has been linked, at least in inflammatory bowel disease, as wor worse outcomes. There's one paper looking at vitamin D and AIH. I check vitamin D in all my patients, and I supplement uh, when they are low. Concurrent inflammatory bowel disease, again, anecdotal. Uh, we seem to think that these patients, which tend to also be younger, so it may be a little bit of a variable there, but again, tend to have worse outcomes. My thought of if, if inflammation is controlled, and is there any way that we can actually optimize? And we, we have to think about what is the goal? Normal liver tests and normal IgG. This is kind of a tenet of practice. And honestly, I would say I tell a lot of my patients that I probably shoot for low normal AST and ALT. There is not firm evidence behind this, but ultimately it's a way to guarantee that, or at least try to guarantee that we think the hepatic inflammation is as good as control as we can get it. We, uh, we know the ALT, though, however, it, it doesn't necessarily reflect the severity. So I have patients come in and say, oh, yes, my ALT was uh, 300. That must be really, really bad. Actually, no. Um, it really depends on the presentation, how long you've had the disease, and how well the control has been. The same thing with IgG. The, the one thing is we actually have a study in paired liver biopsy that seems it actually correlates with improvement of inflama inflammatory activity on the histologic slide or specimen. So another reason that I follow this quite closely in my patients. In terms of if someone is not responding well and they're not hitting those goals, are they compliant? And I hate to say it, young folk, you are less compliant than your older uh, siblings with AIH. We need to look at this. The other ones that are not compliant are those that have mood disorders. We see a lot of missing of doses of medication and going on and off therapy. We also wonder about individualized approaches. Is there something I can do to optimize? And I'll speak specifically to azathioprine and 6MP. Is the way they take it, the formulation they take it, is it getting to the active metabolites that we need to use to cause inflammation control? So in my practice, I'm often checking thioguanine metabolites, uh, linking to at least 240 for TGN to get high enough. The other important reason for looking at this is you get a level of MMP, which is another byproduct of azathioprine or 6-MP metabolism, which unfortunately at very high levels can cause hepatotoxicity. 
High levels of azathioprine also, besides controlling your immune system, can actually over control your immune system. Other things we've seen is actually can contribute to flu-like symptoms and actually impact that quality of life factor. Escalation of dose, um, getting patients levels up in terms of azathioprine or TGN levels. Do I add therapy when someone is at, at goal with azathioprine or 6-MP? Again, what agent do I choose? Um, and we'll talk about this in follow-up lectures as well. Is this patient not responding? Are they a, a potential candidate for a clinical trial? And at our center, we're lucky to have at least one AI study, and there's 11 other ones with Taiwan J today that you'll learn about. But there's also ones in Miami, and hopefully as we come uh, to fruition from our society and the big patient push, that we'll see more agents come to trial as well, particularly for patients that are hard to treat. How do you approach a patient that has a current or a recent cancer diagnosis? And does azathioprine or Cellcept, how do we formulate that into the plan? And there is some data from the inflammatory bowel disease literature that says there may be a slight increased risk of recurrence. I bring this up only to discuss with your doctor. I've gotten in a habit of using some of what we call the mTOR inhibitors, which are anti-proliferative, that would be two of them, sirolimus and everolimus, as a foundational piece of therapy. And we've actually had some pretty good anecdotal response rates that's pretty similar to what we're seeing in the literature as well. And then finally, when patients are on these therapies, you have to ask them how they're doing and monitor for side effects. And many of you probably have experienced these yourself because we probably know at least half of patients and probably more do not end on the regimen they start on to where they are years later. There is typically either dose escalation or a change in therapy or added therapy as well because of things of GI nature, typically upset stomach, diarrhea, but also the bone marrow toxicities. The other thought is, can these medications and these metabolites cause fatigue? The Achilles heel of AIH is the last thing that you want to do. Other considerations is outside of the liver. Again, speaking more of the quality of life factors. Looking and screening for pertinent autoimmune, liver disease, or autoimmune diseases. Fatigue, this is a big one. Itch, surprisingly, even outside of PBC, we see up to 40 to 50% of patients have itch in the past two weeks that have been somewhat impactful in quality of life. I don't see anybody well, itching right now. Um, that also goes along with skin and also the risk factors that come from these, these medications we use, which increase the risk of non-melanoma skin cancer. Bone disease we'll talk briefly about as well. Um, and I know Dr. Keene will talk slight, er, about this as well in the women's issues talk as, as well. Autoimmune diseases, thyroid, Sjogren's, but also celiac. I look for thyroid disease and celiac in all patients. In celiac, there was a very large uh, Norwegian study that looked at seroprevalence of autoantibodies that we see in celiac disease is about 15% in AIH patients. The very interesting thing, those patients were almost all asymptomatic. Now, does that constitute real celiac disease? I'm not sure about it, but I think it's important, as Dr. Egan will tell you in her nutrition lecture, that maybe the management or concurrent management of celiac disease is very important in managing the autoimmune hepatitis. Fatigue, things that we, th we think about, many of us, uh, at least what I've heard from patients is prior doctors have brushed off the fatigue to their disease. And is this really the right approach? Are there things that we can do to optimize this? Fatigue is the number one complaint I hear in the clinic. Screening for mood disorders, this is key. We see a high preponderance and five times risk, higher risk of depression or other axis disorders in patients with AIH. Nutritional deficiencies. Um, I have seen, at least anecdotally, more fat-soluble deficiencies, particularly harping on that vitamin D deficiency. Sleep. Uh, we did a, a small sleep study, at least with social media, the past two years. We see that patients with AIH get the same amount of sleep as most others. It's just not restorative. Poorly controlled disease. Again, can this contribute to fatigue? I suspect it can, but I'll also be honest with you, and many of you probably know, even though your disease is well controlled, it doesn't mean your fatigue melts away. Other medical conditions, I think we overlook this, and you have to screen thinking about pulmonary or cardiac causes of the fatigue. And again, trying to get your foot in the door to try to improve quality of life. Again, itch, it's an important question to ask. Um, we have therapies to strategize against itch, and again, we also know itch is one of the major factors of quality of life as well. I talked briefly about the non-melanoma skin cancer in my patients. I think they should be at least seeing a dermatologist or a good primary care doctor every one to two years for a thorough skin exam. Staying out of the sun and using sunscreen is critically important. Bone, um, every three to five years, I'm recommending that my patients get bone densiometry. 
based on the cohort that I commonly see just based on my location, um, there's a few strikes about my patients. They're women, and most of them are Caucasian. Some of them smoke, that would be a third strike, but we should be looking at this. And we see significant bone loss in the other autoimmune diseases as well. I don't know if it's the same, but it definitely seems to be more prevalent. And when we find it, it is a bear to treat. So we treat early, and we try to maintain calcium and vitamin D supplementation throughout. Some of the final things I'll say is, you know, really looking at AIH, and again, this idea, um, we have a lot of specifics, but you need to step back that 20,000 foot view and look at the patient, and the patient really is the forest. Um, you really must see the forest from the details or the trees. I think it leads to better outcomes with patients, better relationships, um, but, but also a, a better way for the patient to interact with a care provider. And again, I think just asking these questions, again, strengthens that bond. Again, AIH patients, we, we plan on everyone being around for a long time. We want to minimize that, any impact in quality of life and really allow patients to live long, fruitful ones. So really, in conclusion, I want you to engage your physician. I want you to insist on a partnership of care. Again, this is the idea of medicine. We need to shift the medical case, gaze and AIH back to the patient. Again, objective testing is important and helps guide therapies. But again, for what? We want to help your provider also, well, I'm sorry, to shift the gaze. But we also want to, to think, how is AIH different? And really, how, how can you incorporate the idea that the phenotypes can be different in this disease? Again, steering us more to an individualized approach to AIH for the future. Finally, we also want to know and consider the things outside the liver, things that it can impact quality of life. And if your doctor's not asking about these, you need to be telling them about them and kind of what is the plan regarding this? Is there anything that you have an idea or, or, or help with that may improve this overall for me? Thank you very much.